After a ship goes missing on a distant planet, a rescue team is dispatched to investigate. Once they arrive, they encounter an enemy who uses their worst fears against them. Hello everyone, I'm Caleb J. And I'm Josh Allred. Welcome to a new episode of Beyond the Bad. Today, we'll be talking about the Roger Corman produced cult classic, Galaxy of Terror, a film which has many Hollywood heavyweights working early in their careers and many of Corman's signature trademarks for those who are massive fans of his. Uh, the film wouldn't be, you know, unfortunately would not be a huge box office success with many critics um, simply dis- dismissing it as an alien ripoff. Um, but I quite enjoyed it. I know you're a big fan. Um, before I shoot over to you, just uh, the usual, why are we covering this movie? Well, we have half a baseline, right? So unfortunately, I know I have my feelings about Ron Tomatoes like everyone else. Uh, Ron Tomatoes, the critic score is 31%, but that's also only based off 13 reviews. Audience score twenty eight percent. So even though the scores aren't great, if you're a, I know many Corman fans consider this one of his um producing rise, one of his better uh, works that they really like. It's, it has a legacy. But with that, if you guys didn't hear, we have Josh back. He's finally back to pull his weight instead of just slacking like he's been for seven months. No, I'm kidding. He's back. Happy to talk about a I think a personal favorite of his. So with that, I'll shoot over to him the. Say his piece. Yes, I'm so glad that I've been missed in my time away defending your right to slander me in such a way. That's okay. Glad to be back. Glad to be talking movies again. And yes, I do enjoy this movie. It is, is it an alien ripoff? Yes, absolutely. But that is not something that is unknown to the world of low budget film and even uh, even American uh, production companies were no stranger to doing that just like the Italians were um, I will submit as evidence uh, Luigi Cosi's contamination which is itself an alien ripoff so yeah it's it's nothing new the fact that people are ups- were upset by it or even now call it a ripoff whatever It's fine. I love it. Give me that sweet, sweet cheese. This movie is doing doing things a little bit differently than Alien did. Alien was a much more contained, claustrophobic, um, almost kind of slasher movie in a way. That's one, just so everybody keeps count. And you, you have to admire that Roger Corman would be smart enough because yeah, it is smart enough to essentially go out and ride the wake of a successful movie and use that to his advantage. And you've got a decent movie in here. I don't, I I don't know why, what, 11 critics had to pan it, whatever. Like that's their, that's their problem. But I mean, from the guy who gave us Piranha, uh, Humanoids from the Deep, Battle Beyond the Stars. Why Why would you expect anything less from the legend that is Roger Corman? I don't know. And, I mean, th- th- this movie, for better or worse, has continued to be talked about in some form or fashion and is a testament to the enduring careers of people like Robert England, the late Sid Haig, um... There's also some guy named James Cameron that was working on this as a PA and then worked his way up to second unit director. I don't know who that guy is. Never heard of him. Um, But yeah, I mean, why? How how could you not like this? That's all. No, I'm I'm with you. Like it, and it's almost like to me, especially when this came out. It's not like this was like a brand new like young Roger Corman when this film came out. Like this was a guy that has been doing this for a while now. So. What were you expecting at this point? Like, 
he like I said, he has a style, he has an aesthetic with his low, his um low budget indie filmmaking that you know it's him doing it, whether it's producing or directing either way. And if you go in thinking, oh, Galaxy of Terror, Roger Cornstash, this this will be different. No, what 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 are you thinking? You're gonna get more of the same, and you're if you're a fan, you're gonna enjoy it. I personally really enjoyed enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I mean he. The fact that he gets all these, like, not even just this, but you talk about all the way back from, like, you know, Little Shop of Horrors and all the people he gets that are big players in Hollywood now. Like, he essentially gave them their start in Hollywood because he, he was this indie guy willing to take chances, you know. He, he does it. Um, I always think of Charles Mann and Louis Kaufman, too. They do it a lot, obviously. A lot of people that are big now, you know, for those who love James Gunn, start out in trauma. Um, so there's, it's a place for these guys to start. And, you know, yeah, I... It's a, is it a rip like you said? Is it a rip off? Absolutely, but he's also not shy about it. To Corman's credit, he's like, yeah, we made this to rip off aliens, and well, he even <laughs> he even had a quote in the making of documentary where, when he saw Jaws, he was kind of like, oh shit, the big studios have figured us out. They made a schlocky B movie. They made it well. And it made a shitload of money, and he was like, "Well, now what are we gonna do? Like, they're they're taking they're taking pages out of our playbook. So, 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 what are we gonna do?" And at that time, Corman had started uh, New World Pictures, um, which, if anybody remembers their logo, once you see that, you kind of already know what you're in for. Mm -hmm. And he had Piranha under that banner, like I've mentioned all the other movies before. Uh, and that was his way of getting out of the director's chair and becoming the producer that everybody knows him to be now. Mm -hmm. And with that, he got these two guys, the director, uh, Bruce, what is his freaking name again? Bruce uh, D. Clark. Yes, Bruce D. Clark. And the, uh, the writer, one of the writers, they got together and he kind of just gave them, you know, go make, I want a movie like Alien. Give me something like Alien. And what we got was this. And there there are some similarities. You know, you have a crew going to a planet where another ship has disappeared. Mm. The difference being that Corman wanted to use fear in a way to play on the characters and not so much the audience. Because if you watch Alien, you're just like, you're trapped with the crew, but you're also just a bystander. You're just watching this happen with uh, Galaxy of Terror, you are seeing everything happen to them. Like Until you figure out what the concept is, you're kind of confused a little bit. It's like, what the hell is actually going on? But I kind of like that because it doesn't, like with most Hollywood movies, it doesn't hand you every bit of information. You kind of have to just go along for the ride and figure out what the fuck is going on because things change constantly. Each character that gets killed, they're killed by something that they fear the most. And it comes out, no pun intended, uh, in various ways. Uh, up to and including the aforementioned, well, we haven't even mentioned it yet, but the scene that this movie is known for, which we will get to. Well, we will get to it. <laughs> um, but again, like that was also orchestrated by Corman. He always, everybody knew about his famous formula where he would show boobs in his movies every so often just to keep people interested. And Galaxy of Terror is no different. And he even was the one who directed that infamous scene to make sure that he got what he wanted for it. Mm. And to give the audience what they go to these kinds of movies for. Because men, women, whomever is a fan of these kinds of movies, they already have that expectation going in with there's going to be some questionable dialogue, there's going to be some interesting acting choices, and there's going to be lots of nudity. That's just the way it goes. If you're going to make a low-budget movie, you have to use these things to your advantage. It's just like Joe Bob's Three Bs, Blood, Breasts, and Beasts. Mm -hmm. You're going to have those. You're going to make. A, you're going to have a good movie. Yeah, no, absolutely. And... I look. I'm one of those like when I go into a movie, you know, the key is knowing who's making it because then it's like, okay, what what am I should I expect from this director or producer or you know whoever is attached? 
Um, I will say this when it comes to the rip off thing. Watching this film, and I mentioned it earlier. I was saying it when I watched it. I mentioned it earlier to um, earlier today. A lot of people say this rip off is Alien, and yes, yes, to an extent. But I would argue Event Horizon <laughs> rips this film off almost more than this rips Alien off. Uh, yeah, I yeah, I mean, definitely, it's it's functioning more like that, and also taking a page from Lovecraft in in that you have like this unknowable evil that is hell bent on ripping apart the mind of anyone who comes in contact with it. Mm -hmm. And it also happens like that here, but not, not in the most overt Lovecraft way. No. And I, I'm saying this is only actually, I do like event horizon, but I was, I was like, I see the alien rip off, but we're not going to talk about, uh, the other big film that horror fans love and adore that definitely looks like it took some cues from Corman here. Oh yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like for anybody who watches genre movies and is always lamenting that there's nothing original, there's no new ideas that uh, I, I, I don't know why they keep making the same movie over and over and over again. This is not the first time I've said this and it probably won't be the last. There are only so many stories you can tell. And in, in this medium, the only way to stand out is how you go about telling that story and what you, what you choose to film and put on screen that makes your vision different from the five other movies that came out two years ago mm -hmm. or even the week before. And with Corman movies, for good and for bad, they have something that is always going to get you to talk about them. Seems he did have a preconceived idea of what was selling in movies, um, and I don't, I, and I don't think a lot of that stuff would happen today. Obviously, um, unless there was some kind of payback for it, I suppose. Um, but he is all about the shock and the sensation of these things, and that's why the guy's been around in Hollywood for. 40, 50, 60, 70, something ridiculous. He's been it's around a, forever. I mean, he's still going. He has like four yes. or five films in, under, in production that yeah. he's producing. And like I said, without Corman, without somebody like Lloyd Kaufman or Charles Band, you wouldn't have a lot of the big directors and other, other people in the industry who are prolific today. Be, and one of the reasons why Corman did what he did is because he went against the grain of the studio. The studios only hired known quantities and people that they knew their track records for anything. Corman loved nothing more than to recruit young, hungry people straight out of film school or still in film school at USC and give them jobs and let them work their way up because I'm... In, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm a big proponent of learning by doing. And I think that's one of the biggest drawbacks from my experience in college was not getting enough of that practical side of things. Unless you go through one of these like farm system film degree schools where that's all they do is they teach you this kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. just the production side of it. I got a lot of theory, not enough production. And I think if I would have had more production, I probably would have enjoyed my time there. Not saying that I didn't. I did. I wanted to have that more hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. And this is the best way to get that kind of thing. Go out there and just do it. Mm -hmm. And you learn. And you learn from somebody who's made these kinds of movies and has proven to make money making these kinds of movies and how to do it. Use every single trick you know in terms of constructing a film and make, making that illusion real enough that people are immersed in the experience and they're not getting anything taken away from. Yeah, this actually this is a perfect segment to expand more on the question I actually had. It was a perfect lead in if you want to expand on some more um, with this question. And actually, a quick sign out: the school I went to for uh, film school was actually the opposite. It was more practical, less um, theoretical, but it was also over in Florida that immediately does not have the hugest film market, so it was hard to try to break outside of school afterwards um with people and it was i was like the only horror lover there it was it was tough um 
that's not here nor there. So, well, what you were going off, I, I actually want to go ahead and ask the question, see if you have more to add. And that is, um, for those who don't know, because Josh has been gone a while, you, uh, you know, you, I know how much you love trauma. You have introduced me to trauma myself big time. I know you've introduced many people to trauma and your love for Lloyd Kaufman. I know how much you, you know, look up to people like Roger Corman, obviously, Charles Band. And my question is like, what do you think they have helped contribute to cinema, especially in the independent market? Which I know you kind of hit on with the young talent, but do you think those may even uh, more than the young talent involved? Like, does there more? Um, I think I think something that I've always enjoyed about low budget B movies and the thing that is the is the spirit behind them is the mm-hmm. fact that they are they are committed to making making a movie and they bring that that drive and that desire to make this movie by any means necessary um lloyd always made the analogy of like you know you you come to work on a trauma set you're not going to make a lot of money and you're probably going to be shitting in a bag and eating cheese sandwiches the whole time and for all and for all jokes aside yep he's He's not lying. Um, and everything that they, every resource they have, all the money, all the time, all the talent goes into the movie. Everybody is is in service to the movie. Whereas on the flip side, if you have big budget things, it's all in service to the people who are giving you the money to make the thing. Mm-hmm. The people do it in on the lower end of things for the love of the art of making it. And that passion comes out and you can feel it now that also has something to be said for you know quality and talent and in those kinds of things a lot of times those are lacking but i would i would enjoy a movie more if i could know that the people that were doing it were giving their all instead of just going there just to make a bunch just in the hope that they could make a bunch of money because a lot of times that's a gamble and that gamble isn't going to be taken by somebody with millions of dollars on an idea that they don't think they can get their money back on. Mm. But without, without these low budget movies, I don't think you would have a lot of, uh, exposure to, uh, diversity, um, different people from different walks of life, um, telling stories. And that's important. If, if you don't have that, all you have is one avenue of these things getting shoved down your throat and to where it all becomes homogenized and you can't tell one movie from the other. And that's why I get turned off by a lot of more mainstream movies because they all just feel the same. You could chart from the calendar year through how many movies are similar and you probably wouldn't be able to tell one from the other unless you noted different actors or a different director. And even then that doesn't matter because it's, it's often the money that dictates everything. There isn't a lot of money in low budget filmmaking. So they are in service of the story that they're telling and they're putting it all out there. Cause th- this might be the only movie these people make mm-hmm. in their life ever. So go for broke. But it, if, for me, it's always been about, the the desire and the passion and the commitment to making making the story come to life yeah. that I've always treasured more than any fucking hundred million dollar movie. No, I, I will honestly want to, I will second that one hundred percent. For me, you know, I've talked about it before. Like the reason, especially you know, especially us being big horror nuts, I just I love in, independence and in horror cinema more than I like the mainstream because I just feel like. There's more passionate, there's more heart, they're trying to make something different and unique and just a movie, essentially. You know, they're just trying to make a movie. Um, Because, yeah, like you said, there's only so many ways we can tell a story. Like, for those, I'm with you. You know, I I knew someone (laughs) long ago that, you know, they try to be like, that like to make a point, Hollywood doesn't make anything new and different. I was like, well, there's only so many ways to tell a story. You know what I mean? Um, That's why when, like, you know, my golden example is always the the first John Wick movie. I'm like, the bare bones of that story we've seen a thousand times, but because that director approached it with passion, because Connie Reeves was passionate about wanting to do this, and like 
they went at it and they said, Let's, how do we make this different and put our spin on it? it it's now launched a now about to be four film series. I mean, it was a huge hit. And it worked out for them. I mean, that's I know that's more on the mainstream side. But, you know, when you just get people that want to make a new movie and they want to just put their heart, their blood, their sweat, their tears in it, you get something magical. And I'm with you. It doesn't, even if it's not the best acting or the best production value compared to this $100 million movie, I'll still take it over over that. Because, yeah, that looks nice, but there's no heart. There's no soul. It just looked nice. They got actors they knew were going to get butts in the seats, and they went, and we're done. We're just going to let it happen. Let it ride. And it, 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 gets, it gets really annoying, and why it just gets really annoying trying to watch. Going to the cinema sometimes where you're like, God, do I really, especially now with the superhero craze that's been going on for quite a while. Um, every so often you're just like, do I really need to go see the superhero film? Like, is What makes it different from like the 10 that we get in one year? Yeah, it's hard. Um, part of me likes the big dumb movies. Obviously, I mean, I two movies I saw when I was overseas. I saw uh, Doctor Strange in Greece, and then when I was in Croatia, I saw Thor: Love and Thunder. So mm-hmm. I I went there and I saw them because a it was probably the only movie I was going to get to see if I did want to go out, and I. I didn't have a doubt that it was going to be out there because these are giant ass movies that are going to go every to every corner of the world in order to make their money back. They have to. It's it's almost like they're set up to be that way because they are putting so much money into them. But like we just had an example of a movie that was made for peanuts comparatively in Terrifier 2 that has probably going to come close to like quadrupling its money by the time it gets out of its third week now coming up in theaters. And I also saw that uh, it's even getting released overseas. Um, Mm -hmm. Somebody from Umbrella uh, put out that it's going to be playing uh, during Halloween weekend in Australia. So yeah, Terrifier 2 uh, is going to be playing in Australia, which is awesome. Um, And I'd just listened uh, while I was driving around to uh, Damian Leone talking to uh, Adam Green and Joe Lynch and talking about the budget for that movie and how everything was just grassroots and everything that went into it is just following in this mold of doing everything you can yourself to save as much money on the production to get what you can on screen. You know, Damien Damien Leone building all of the prosthetics and doing all of the setups and having his background as a special effects artist only helped him in getting that film made cheaper. So he could afford to wear four hats on that movie in addition to writing and directing and being special effects and all of this other stuff. He could do that because he had the he had the actual practical skill of doing these things. And now he's reaping the rewards. I loved nothing more than seeing uh, its first weekend out in theaters that it had knocked uh, Top Gun Maverick out of the top ten. Hilarious. I loved it. It's and holding its own against like main, like big things like Halloween and Smile, which has been dominating at the box office. And very good fun of those of you who haven't seen Smile yet. Um, but it's it's beating them. Like It's destroying those guys. Yeah, and it's a two-plus-hour gory-as-hell uncut slasher movie like how can you how can you say that in 2022 and not be and not be surprised and for somebody like me like you totally excited about something like that and i don't think those kinds of things would happen or there wouldn't be a precedent for it if you didn't have roger corman doing these kinds of things lloyd kaufman doing the things that he was doing um you you have to even if this mo- this kind of stuff is not your cup of tea and you feel like these movies are beneath you, whatever, I feel like there should be some acknowledgement to the success that these kinds of things have. Because at the end of the day, they're still playing in the same sandbox. Mm-hmm. They might not be in the deep end with the big boys, but they're still making stuff. And they're still existing. Mm-hmm. When larger studios go under, 
or get swallowed up into giant monopolies. These guys are still hanging around. Troma still exists. New World doesn't exist, but Roger Corman is still making movies. Yep. Charles Band is still making movies. Those matter. That means mm-hmm. something. No, no, I'm with you. You know, you see in the news on the on the big movie side of things, you know, obviously everyone knows what's going on with WB currently, right? The big that's been like dominating the more bigger side of the news. But no one talks about the fact that, like you said, like Trump was still going. Like he he came out. I mean, I have not had a chance to see it because I know it's. Um, I think they're still working out different release distributions. But you know, Shakespeare. Or, I'm sorry. Hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm. You know that came out what earlier this year, I believe, or last year. But that the like, brand new Trumer film directed by Lloyd Kaufman. It's still going. You know, Charles Man, like you said, still going with Full Moon. He uh. I saw on their socials that they're filming Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Bar Walmart too. Like, it's not dying. Corman, like I mentioned earlier, when he was on uh, Joe Bob, um, The Last Drive, and he mentioned he has about four or five films that he's producing in active development. They're happening. Like, these guys are still going. You know, um, obviously in the case of Trauma and uh, Full Moon, they've even found a way to adapt. I think that's been one of the coolest things too, with like, especially these three guys are always... I don't mean to group them together like I'm trying to diminish them. I just kind of like because of what they've achieved, I can't put them in the same category just for my own brain. Um, But, you know, they found ways to adapt throughout the years. You know what I mean? Like they had obviously their theater time when they early on when they started. And then the home video market came up as, you know, we saw the shift from like, okay, we're going to put the big movies out in theaters and not really going to play these smaller films. When that shift was slowly starting to happen, they adapted. They honed in on the home video market, you know, especially Full Moon Man. They honed in on that home video market, um, and now, in you know, twenty twenty two, it was like they had that moment again of like, well, what are we doing now? Video stores are gone. Everything's streaming. Oh, trauma now. Full Moon Direct. Like they just said, hey, let's do that and just make it streaming, and then we can still get our movies out there, you know. So for the for a lot of trauma fans, if you're like, oh, I can't even find a trauma movie. Just go on Troma now. It's probably going. It's probably there or will be there at some point. It's actually how I watched Return to Nuke Them High Volume Two, so I've been trying to get my hands on that one. Um, or full, you know, Full Moon. We were talking about earlier. They even offer like, hey, if you sign up for it, you can get the Puppet Master box set or twelve movies for like I think like twelve nine or some like absurd cheap amount just for subscribing to their service. So the fact that they've been able to just Unlike these big studios that are getting, like, like obviously with Fox being bought by Disney or WB, who I, which might be crashing and burning in, the, in front of our eyes, you know, MGM getting bought by Prime, these guys have done nothing but find ways to adapt and change and just keep on going. It's very true. I love it. Because it's just like a middle finger to the, the mainstream. That no matter what, they're like cockroaches. They're always going to be there, no matter what. Yeah, no, they're, they're never... People can talk down as much as they want, but... And you talked about it earlier, right? Rick community, if, for anyone who does know, if you haven't learned, the horror community is strong. And we keep stuff alive for a long, long time. And as long as they just keep doing what they're doing, there's going to be young, old... Mm-hmm. No age horror fans there to eat it up and say like this is what I like this is the kind of film I like and I want to see more of and I mean it and honestly we're just kind of reaping the benefits because now we're getting to a point where a lot of the people who did grow up watching this stuff as we I kind of to me at least this year with horror and even like for runs the studio releases we got a lot of daring out there horror films from once that were getting for once theater and bigger releases like in X and Barbarian and Smile and like it's because it's a horror community that watch films like this. We're like, oh my god, I want to do that. And they just work their asses off. And now they're reaping these benefits that... For a while there seemed like it was going away. You know, with obviously like the horror remake craze that took over. And found in all the different crazes that Hollywood latches on to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that'll that'll always happen. There, there's always going to be an attempt to, uh, to use my analogy from the alien thing is just to ride in the wake of something else that's successful and it's 
it's a technique that is never going to go away. It's always going to happen. I'm sorry, as much as we like to think we're creative, humans aren't that creative. We're going we're, 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 we're gonna to tell the same stories. Again, it's just in a matter of how you present it. And it matters who is saying those kinds of things, um, where they come from, what their background is, what their life experience is, what, you know, what kind of whatever subculture, subgroup they belong to. There is going to be uniqueness in that. That's why I am all about, you know, the, the recent celebration of a lot of queer movies that are coming out mm -hmm. and the fact that there should be a lot more and there are, there, there, there will continue to be more. Um, but oh, by the way, it's always been there. You just weren't noticing it and that's fine. Take something and f look at it in a newer context mm -hmm. and understand that this kind of stuff has always existed whether or not you knew it it was always there so yeah i mean just like there is always something worth going back to in a movie which is why i generally will watch movies more than once um there's a lot that's going on in this movie that you don't necessarily think about because you're more concerned with what's unfolding in front of you you're like you're not thinking about the machinations behind it and why it is what it is mm. so yeah. yeah it took me until closer to them from that i was like oh this is what's going on Cause first I was like what is going on in this movie and then as it went i was like oh wait okay it's clicking i get it i understand what's happening yeah but uh yeah that was so unless we had any more to add i feel like we are good to go ahead and move on to development hell let's do it let's do it now there's two big things attached to this film that kept popping out when I was doing the the online research. Unfortunately, I just don't have time to look through uh, your Blu-ray at the bonus features, but I know you did, so you will be my backup on that. But one of the first big ones, you mentioned it earlier, a certain director whose film everyone's going gaga about that's coming out this year, Mr. Avatar Man himself, James Cameron. Who? <laughs> if if anyone legitimately is wondering who he is, go watch Terminator and go watch Aliens, and you know what? Go watch True Lies as well. Do anything pre-Titanic, you you will be rewarded. Sorry for those who like everything Titanic post. So, on this like as I alluded to earlier, Corman and we mentioned it was very well known in taking young hungry celebrity, you know, we're well, now celebrities, but Young, hungry people that we know as celebrities both behind and front of the camera and getting them to work on his film. Galaxy of Terror, no different, right? So in this case, we have good old James Cameron. He worked as a production designer and eventually moved all the way up to second unit director. So he literally in one movie worked his way to top, which again, another great thing about indie filmmaker series that they actually allow other people to rank up. It's not something you see on the bigger budgeted studio stuff you gotta stay in your lane a lot of the times this would uh be his second feature on a corman production after uh battle beyond the stars i found so this was their second collaboration um it sounds like him and corman had a pretty great working relationship um corman had just really liked using them and cameron looked like seemed like he liked that corman let him do his thing and experiment and just help contribute to the film um, one particular thing he contributed to this film, I know there was one you mentioned earlier, I'll say that for you to mention, but one thing I, I picked up on was, um, Cameron figured out a way to make maggots move at some point on cue for a certain part of the movie. Um, he developed a metal plate, put the maggots on the said plate, ran a, an electric current through it when they would start filming and it caused the maggots to start moving the way Corman needed them to for the scene. So that was one way... That we saw the young James Cameron kind of start to show his abilities. Because for those who know that the man is a technical wizard behind that camera. Um, there's also a couple of other uh, things that were quite ingenious in, in my opinion. Uh, he also, uh, when in watching the making of documentary, they also said he figured out or learned that maggots are photosensitive. And if... 
they are exposed to light, they will try and hide and get away from it. So that is another technique he used. He didn't just mildly electrocute them um, to get them uh, motivated. Um, it's also well documented that the corridors of the spaceship quest were lined with Big Mac containers. Yes, you heard that right. McDonald's had a hand in helping with the production design of this. Uh, it was also, that set was also leased to a uh, German uh, commercial uh, production company and Corman uh, let them use it and some of that money was used to help with the budget of the movie. So again, Corman always thinking, how can I make a buck out of this? How can I get the most mm -hmm. out of this? And if you actually look at it, you can see like, that, do that does look like a fucking burger box. Holy shit. Literally fucking styrofoam containers that were painted and stapled up to the walls. So, That's filmmaking right there. Yeah, on top of using things like mats and mm. uh, process shots, there's miniatures. Um, all of these tricks and techniques mm. were used in order to make the movie look more expensive than it actually was. And that is a lot of what lower budget movies have to rely on. They have to actually rely on the craft of making movies mm. and giving you the illusion because that's all movies are. It's an illusion from the from a drama, a romantic comedy, whatever. It's all an illusion to get you to believe the world that you're watching. And this movie was no different. And Cameron was all about that kind of thing. He worked with he worked with special effects. A lot of the special effects that you see, he signed off on them or he helped in creating them. Um, he was very instrumental in the design from the ground up of the look of the movie. Mm -hmm. And that only happened because Corman had complete trust in him. And it was said quite often that when Corman would visit the set, the first place he would go was Cameron's office to talk to him about what was going on. And if you're just breaking into the industry, I think the only, the, the, the few movies that he had worked on, which one of his earlier directing efforts was the, uh, sequel to Joe Dante's Piranha, which he didn't even finish. He was fired from directing for that. Um, he tries not to admit he directed, but we know. Yes. We know. Um, you can't hide from us, James Cameron. Um, it, all of those experiences pushed into this. And even when you look at Aliens, you can see all of those tricks Cameron brought with him from movies like this and made them work even better when he had a budget to work with. Mm -hmm. So, like, you, you you, can't take away from Roger Corman his contributions to any, any amount of filmmaking history, movies that have come out, because he was there to foster these kinds of people through. He was mm -hmm. there to give them a chance to prove themselves and to make these movies and find a way to make them look better than, you know, basically these movies were punching way above their weight. And it's all a credit to Roger Corman giving somebody like James Cameron a chance, and James Cameron having the talent and the vision to get those things on screen. Because you look at some of these set pieces, like, yeah, like a lot of the graphics and the way these things, it, it, it hasn't aged well, but you can still admire the the technique behind it the craft behind it constructing these things and making these shots work because if you don't have the money to do that kind of shit there's always there, there's a there's a line in uh terra firmer which is a trauma movie um i still need to see that one yes so they have a character in there who's a smug uh steven spielberg loving big budget movie fan and he hates all low budget movies even though he's the sound guy in a low budget movie <laughs> Uh, so admire the hypocrisy there. And he, and one of his lines was, well, if you don't have the money, you don't make the movie. And that is the most smug thing anybody could say about making a movie because so many people would not have their start if they waited to have the money to make their movie. No. Yeah, so like Lloyd says, make your own damn movie and 
do this kind of stuff. Get creative because it's all an illusion. Exactly. I yeah. Um, and that's actually like God. That's something you always hear about with like the big budget movies. Why was this movie not being made? Oh, we ran out of money. Well, okay then. Um, because yeah, think about like this. Like you know, when people want to come after you know, and the more smug, um, Oscar type of movie lovers. No offense to fellow film gasm <laughs> friends. <laughs> I know y'all. I know Connor and Austin aren't like this at all compared to actual like full on you know Oscar snob people. Um, but when they put these movies down, I want us to sit there and be like, without someone like Roger Corman, would you have someone like James Cameron working or an actor like Jack Nicholson, Jonathan Demme, all these people that just work? Uh, Samuel Jackson, I believe, was on an early Corman um, film. I know he's in. Was it Corman? I know he's in some one of those one of the three guys is early. Oh, he was so, in Death by Temptation. There we go. Yes. I was like, I know he was in something. That's, yeah. God, that, that was good movie. Thank you, Joe Bob, for showing me that one. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, because they got that start in these films and the people took risks with them, or in a case like this, Galaxy Terry, you know, you got a pre-Freddy uh, Krueger Robert England, you know, and you have Sid Haig, who, I mean, uh, granted, you know, for those who want more, talk about Sid Haig to uh, check out the House of Thousand Corpses episode where I gush about my love for him in that movie. Shameless plug. Yes, but uh, you know, I'm you know, it was cool for me seeing that. I'm like, oh shit, you know, it's Sid Haig because as I kind of talked about in that episode, my intro to him was House of Thousand Corpses because you know, again, I was born in '92, so by the time that those films came out, I was like, oh, who's this guy? This is cool. Um, and seeing him in this, like, in early. An early-ish film where I know he's been around for quite a while before this came out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He yeah. Had, he had made Spider Baby back in like the mid '60s. Honestly, I something know something like that. That was one of his first movies, and then through the '70s, he was in a lot of black exploitation movies uh, because he is a big, imposing man. He was always played. He always played the heavy. He always played the dude that was there mm -hmm. to fucking rough people up, shoot the guns, kill people, that kind of thing. Which is always in direct contrast to his actual personality, which is well documented as being a very tender and wonderful human being. So, yeah, um, I don't I, I don't remember where you left off with the production part of it, but um, you know, still talking about James Cameron. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's where we left off. We're still on James Cameron. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of a, a lot of these. People that would go on to have very, very, very long careers in Hollywood. Um, I mean, Robert England, we just mentioned him. He mm -hmm. was literally playing the character that created or put New Line in the position that it was in. The house that Freddie built. Like, it's Robert England. Mm -hmm. And even here, though he's playing a kind of goofy character at times he was still cutting his teeth and still making a name for himself. And again, Roger Corman, he was just want, he just wanted to work. Robert England just wanted to work and he went in and he did it. And it's because of things like that, that we got him three years later in fucking nightmare on Elm street. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Three years after this, he's playing Freddy Krueger a role that makes his career so leaves his mark on movie history let alone horror history and he has a character that brings a fledgling production company all the way to the top so again roger corman with the assist yeah and um just kind of and the root i know we keep you know james cameron but i just want to point out to everyone i know i make it sound like i despise james cameron quite a bit I just wanted him to go back to pre-Titanic type work when he cared about story and special effects. I just feel like he's focused mostly on special effects now and the story has gone by the wayside since Titanic has come out. That's all I'm saying. True Lies, The Abyss, Aliens, Terminator 1 and 2. <sighs> Great movies. I'm not standing in the way of any of the nerds that come after you, just so you know. They're not knocking it on our doors, but... You know, feel it, free to ding him on social media. You can find him on Twitter at scarycaleb92. Go, I, go. I muted it. Go get, oh, that's <laughs> terrible. Don't be like that. 
No, I, I guess it's funny when I say people like, oh my god, I'm like, I'm not even saying I fucking don't. I'm not saying I don't like. I'm just saying there is an error that I love, and he left his mark, and fucking, I'm so glad we got him as a director. I just wish it kept going, and he wasn't so focused on Avatar sequels. Um, but hey, point is, like we were talking about, right? They got their start here. A lot of them. I mean, actually, about England. I mean, he was to the point where like. There are people that don't even like horror that just know who he is, thanks to Freddy Krueger. My own, you know, my mom, who could care less about horror, anytime she sees him, she goes, oh, hey, it's Freddy. Like, that's how she says it. Oh, hey, it's Freddy Krueger. Like, yeah, and like I said, three years prior, he's cutting his teeth in this little Roger Corman movie. Um, so, yeah, that is the first significant part of this film, is the people involved going on to bigger things, right? And like I said, the internet mostly focuses on James Cameron, because it's James Cameron. But that's the first thing, right? The next big thing to talk about that the internet is all about. We alluded to it earlier, so how about we just get into it? Well, how do you want to go about this? Do you, do you want to try and and go through the... Do you, do you want to set kind up of like, Kind of like go through the plot of it to get there? Um, or do you just want to just slap that big gooey bastard right on the table and let's just go let's go slap the big gooey bastard on the table <laughs> okay so <laughs> so there's a uh you can set up the scene if you would like no no no, I don't. no, no I don't know. like there's a uh there's a nice little opening line uh that comes with this uh little insert on my shout factory uh blu-ray of this movie and the author who i will credit for this uh because you don't uh you can't not get credit for it uh their name is uh Yvonka Vukovic and they, they started out with if you're going to blatantly rip off alien why not throw in a giant space maggot raping and there it is that is the thing this movie is known for not some of the other things that one of the things that I'm going to I'm going to talk about when we get to the awards section of this is literally right at the beginning of the movie. But, no. You can't really compare to a giant maggot that's very, very horny. Um, and it it comes about as a precursor, or as the after effect from the death of Sid Haig's character. And the character that is the victim of said demonic or rather terrifyingly horny maggot is um I'm trying to think of her name taffy o'connell her character uh damia so she discovers sid Haig's arm after he's been killed and the uh aforementioned maggots that were there one of them slinks off and inexplicably grows to absurd proportions um which, <coughs> if you're going to go for it, and you're going to do this, that's number two. Um, if you're going to go for it, it is, it might as well be big and gooey. Might as well be big and gooey. And the Good. fact that this thing weighed half a ton is even more frightening because it does almost squish this poor, poor woman who had to be underneath it and slowly have her clothes ripped off and covered with ice cold slime at two o'clock in the morning when they were shooting this scene, which she was not happy about. I don't know who would be happy about it, but if that is your kink, no shame from here. No shame from this guy. I'm absolutely kink shaming. And that's why you're single. So we're just gonna You're also single. Yeah, but I don't shame. There's no shame in my game. Do what makes you happy. I've been getting laid more than you. What? <laughs> Before I was so rudely interrupted, um, yeah. So I guess I, I guess we need to kind of set this up with how the how the film functions and what makes it different from Alien in the fact that when this crew comes up to this monolithic pyra pyramid on this weird storm ridden planet, they fall victim to whatever they fear the most. And according to Corman and the screenwriters, when they were setting this all up, Corman wanted fear to be the thing that kills all of them. 
and for the character of Damia, uh, they all figured that even though she was a very smart, very capable woman, she was scared of sex. Go figure. Why not? Pretty sure it was a last minute decision to get this scene I, okayed. I don't know if it was last minute in so much as I want to stick in a giant rapey maggot scene. So this is going to be the biggest, the biggest twist, it's the most unexpected thing. Hmm, you're you're scared of sex, so why not a giant space maggot killing you and raping you? Yeah, yeah, sure, that that'll throw them off. Um, and so she is approached by this creature, pins her down, and in the hour that it takes to film the more uh, titillating uh, sequences of this scene. Yes. Um, her clothes are slowly ripped off of her and she is very obviously getting humped by this maggot. You, you see thrust. Lots of it. Um, along with lots of gross sucking sounds. Um, and then her screams turn into sounds of pleasure. Like it is very confusing as far as like, does she like this? Does she hate this? Is she scared or is she horny? Which... Funny enough, this brings me to uh, an, the uh, Holliston Hobgoblin episode of Holliston where Adam is trying to give Corey direction and he's telling her that she's scared, but she's also horny. And, she's, <laughs> and she asks him, how am I, I going to be horny if I'm scared? He's like, you're, ju you're ju just go with it. So, again, she, uh, she just has to go with it. I and, love that episode. <laughs> right? Uh it is, uh, I, I don't know how I managed to tie those two together. My brain works in mysterious I did, ways. I didn't even think about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was a really good, that's right. You know what? If I'd had that on a board and I'd have been like, Hollis and Hobgoblin, Galaxy of Terror, I, what do they have in common? I See? have, do you say that, but in my mind it's that Charlie Day meme. <laughs> I'm always sunny and that's you. <laughs> Just, oh, no, that's definitely me when I talk about movies. 100%. Um, so yeah, she, she is, she falls victim to the scariest thing in her mind, which apparently is a giant horny maggot. If you want to be terrified of that, but yes. I mean, I would be terrified of that. You probably not because you're weird. Um, and that's that okay. Maggot, that maggot looks enticing. Okay. That's okay. Let it take me. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll lean into it. Go ahead, describe the scene some more. Ladies, he's single. Um, There's a reason why. <laughs> and we're, we're hearing about at least a few of them already. Um, so but yeah, I... it's, it's, it's just one of those things. Like, you, you have a scene like this, you can't not talk about it. It's always going to be the thing that gets you to talk about this movie. And again, for mm. bad or for worse you're going to talk about this movie in one way or another. And I think that's what makes these kinds of movies different than something more mainstream that wouldn't even, they wouldn't even approach this. If this showed up in the script, it would have gotten axed immediately. Oh. And funny enough, when this movie was first submitted to the MPAA X rating. Yep. And the only thing they had a problem with that scene you don't know what you want to know what they cut out? Four frames. And Corman was pissed. He was like, four fr Well, I just don't understand these people. What do I gotta do to make this movie an R? Like, oh my god. And yeah, so those four frames were lost forever. Uh there would never be a uh more maggot raping scene added edition of this movie, uh, because those four frames have been lost to time. Um and the the movie that you see is the R-rated cut of this movie, which you look at, even if you look at it now, this movie is over 40 years old. You look at it and you're like, that's a little excessive because yeah. they don't, they don't, they don't pull any punches when they, when they really, there's no like subtlety. There's no artful implication of the damage that's being done to this poor woman. The only it's thing they there. don't, the only thing they don't have in there is blood. It's really the only thing they don't have. There's lots of sticky, shiny goo and weird sounds that don't sound like they should be coming out of a woman being raped by a maggot, but they're in there. And it 
it is the thing that this movie is remembered for. Much like in Humanoids from the Deep, you got some giant horny mm-hmm. creatures from the deep that are just walking out with boners, and their whole their whole mission is to impregnate the women on the shore. I, I, with that, I quite enjoy Humanoids from the Deep. I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's, I really like that movie. Not because I, I'm naming myself whole. Oh, big one. The point is. <laughs> This was my first time watching Galaxy of Terror, this particular Corman production, right? I knew about this scene because, like, I'm talking about it. Everyone knows about it. It's just one of those things that when you mention Galaxy of Terror, they're like, oh, yeah, the one with the, the, the maggot raping scene. I'm like, I remember when I first I was like, I'm sorry, the what? Say that again? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And when I was watching it for this, I knew it was coming. I was aware, you know, because I was doing some kind of research as I'm watching, you know, kind of multitasking for the script. And... Even then, watching for the first time, I still wasn't ready. I'm like, oh, this, oh, 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 my God. I'm like, oh, boy. It, and I'm like, why is there so much, like, sucking noises? I'm like, why? I was like, I mean, granted, whoever's doing the sound on this movie deserves a fucking award, but dear God. It's it, so wet. Oh, it's wet and everything. I do. I'm glad we talked about it on that because I mostly have how they came to doing this scene in my script how this all came about <laughs> so let's let's get into that so in the original script the character we mentioned damia uh played by uh Ta- taffy you said taffy taffy o'connell taffy o'connell she was to die topless while being stripped and consumed by a monster so she was going to be naked no matter what why not only is it well roger corman right he, we just talked about he had a formula to the amount of boobs he saw in a movie. But also, Corman had promised financial backers of the film a sex scene with O'Connell involved. So there was that, that was the hitch. He was like, oh shit, I did promise him a sex scene and I have to deliver on my promises. If anything, I applaud the man for keeping his promises. So, he would rewrite the, like we talked about, he rewrote the scene, which included full nudity, far more explicit sexual content. Basically, the scene we got. <laughs> um, And then, like you said, you write, she would react with terror, because obviously there's a fucking huge maggot about to rape her. And then it would get turned into a rouser, where at that point, you as a viewer are very confused on how to fill in the scene. Um, as it's raping her, right? And then she would perish, apparently due to a fatal, how do I word this? Ah, a fatally intense orgasm. So she was coming to death. Yes. Okay. I don't know if that's poetic or not, but something about it feels right with the scene. Are you sure you're not still digging yourself a hole right now? I've never gotten out of the hole. Ladies, he's single. I, I'm staying single until the day I die, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I'm slowly accepting that the closer, like, 30 is getting um, coming, you know? It's like, oh, boy. <sighs> but, as you kind of alluded to earlier, right? He does all this, rewrites it into what we got, goes to tell O'Connell and uh, Bruce uh, DeClark, the director. Both balked at the idea. They were like, oh my god, Roger. No. So Roger did what he does best. goes, oh, that's fine. We're still making the movie, but now I'm directing it. I'm directing that scene. You still got to act in it. Not only that, he even he even said if she was uncomfortable doing some of the other uh, more nude scenes, that he would just use a body double. Yeah, and that's actually the next thing I had. Yeah. Was <laughs> that a body double was indeed used for the full... Nudity shots. Um, even though he did a good chunk of what you see is the original actress, but yes, our little quick moments, it's a full body double. He, Hooker by crook, man. He he was going to get his goddamn mag. He look again. I appreciate. I kind of appreciate the the fact that he's like, look, I made a promise. I have to fulfill this promise. We he can, has a reputation to uphold at this point. Yeah, he's a man of his word. <laughs> He's like, I don't care what else happens in this movie, but we have to have this. For the love of God. I mean, it's the exclamation point. It's the terror in the galaxy of terror part of the title. 
Yeah, I'll give you that one. Now you better. After the whole I've been digging myself. Um. <laughs> now, this would be the next roadblock that we mentioned. This scene got good old Roger Corman the X rating. Man was not to be deterred. He made the cuts necessary, kicking and screaming the way it sounds, which I get. I We've talked before, I believe, about how we feel about the uh, MPA. Now they dropped an A. Now they're just MPA. Um, they still suck. Yeah, no, they still suck. But, uh, yeah, we've talked about that and just how dumb it is. But um, he did eventually make the guys get the R rating. Um, and in a weird sort of way, um, the scene, like I said, has lived on to the point that even um, Clark has actually admitted in more recent years that it's the biggest reason for the film's success. Um, he still stands by his opposition to it being included. I have a quote about Robert England. Uh, he was at a, I think he was at a convention or something, and he was preparing himself to meet uh, meet someone very notable, and. He introduced himself as Robert England. He goes, he says, oh, yeah, you're brilliant in that movie where the maggot fucked that girl. <laughs> so even Robert England cannot escape the ever-looming shadow of the rapey maggot. And not only that, not only was he in the movie where that maggot fucked that girl, but he was brilliant. Game respects game. Give credit where it's due. But, again, you're in that movie where that maggot fucked that girl. I love that the fans, like, I really like No, it wasn't you. even a fan. It was, I, I don't remember who the person was, but he was somebody that Robert England was very, uh, very uh, excited to meet. Oh, okay. So, no, like, and so uh, it was, it was, a, it was, it was an industry kind of person. And he was like, oh, you were brilliant in that movie with that maggot fucked that girl. Sorry, I just wanted to say that again. It's great. Um, but yeah, that, again, just a testament to the impact that that scene has. I mean, even now, like, the movie's 40-plus years old. You can't get away from it. No. Like I said, 40-plus years old, I heard about it, and I still sit there going, I'm watching a maggot rape a woman to death. <laughs> well, to be fair, he makes her come to death. Oh, yeah, sorry. She has... I, I don't know if it's the greatest or worst orgasm that kills you. I mean, it just depends on what side of the fence you're sitting on, man. Like I said, I don't kink shame. You apparently are a judgmental Judy. I should never say anything. There's a hole that I'm just not escaping this episode. Oh, no, you're done. You're done. <laughs> you're like buried. You're just... Every time you try to speak, you're just I would make. Your I would out. make a reference to Barbarian if you've seen the goddamn movie. Yeah, you can't, so don't. Then you're really gonna dig yourself deeper, cause I'll hurt you. You better watch it when it comes on HBO Max. You son of a bit. Okay. Uh -huh. I've only been back for not just not even a week yet. God, it feels Calm like, down. Feels like forever. Um, O'Connor herself. I like, even... that. I like that transition. That was flawless. <laughs> Fucking flawless. Continue. Thank you. She herself has also come around to the movie. Or uh, well. She likes the movie. She's coming around to the scene. Sorry. She's coming around to the scene. Um, and at, like we talked about earlier, she's revealed on several interviews and you know conventions and whatnot that uh, this maggot almost collapsed on her at one point. So she did almost quite literally die by this halftime maggot. Um, art, life was about to imitate art in a not fun way. That would have been a hell of a way to go. Instead of being in that movie where that maggot fucked that girl, you're going to be in that movie where that maggot fucked that girl and killed her. You you decide which one you want to be known for. <laughs> well, with that, now that we've properly talked about the, uh, the maggot scene, just to reiterate at the beginning again, you know, you know, the film didn't catch on release, right? It was, I'd say, probably about as good as probably what his films were probably doing around that time, box office wise. The the hardcore Roger Corman fans went and saw this. They went to go knowing what they were seeing, right? Um, again, critics weren't so kind, but again, that's based off thirteen goddamn reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, but 
like many of Corman's projects, it's endured for the years, right? It's it's become a cult classic. It's considered by many fans, from what I've heard um, from you and um, from just online talks that a lot of people place this as one of their personal favorites. It tends to be highly up there in uh, Corman's um, work outside of, you know, obviously things he's done with like Edgar Allan Poe and whatnot. But um, I do see this usually at the top of a lot of people. So that's usually in the top 10, top five. I, I see Galaxy of Terror pop up there. Yeah, I mean it's and it's also it's also a uh, a product of Corman's creative process from start to finish. Like one of the other things Corman was famous for is somebody would design a poster for a movie and he would be like, "Okay, make that movie." Have nothing else to know about it. No, not even an outline. Make that movie. The the poster that is known for Galaxy of Terror contains literally nothing that is actually in the movie because the creature you see on the cover of it is nowhere in the fucking movie itself. <laughs> so again, it is just a, it is from top to bottom. It is created to suck you in again for bad or for worse to get you to watch this thing. And I, I keep growing more fond of this the more I watch it. Rapey Maggot and all, this movie is definitely a party movie. It's something you can have on in the background um, because there are just moments. And it, for for me, it ties into my awards where you just have these moments where you're just like, oh, my God, seriously? Like, you got this lady in this movie and that guy in this movie? Because none of the characters feel like they're in the same movie. They're all all in different (laughs) movies in their head. And I kind of like that. Because this movie is also about what people fear the most. So if you take it that way, every everything kind of makes sense. All bets are off. You know, nobody's going to, if if this was us in a movie, I'm not going to see the thing that you're scared of. You're not going to see the thing I'm scared of. And if we had other people with us, that same shit would happen. That We'd see them dying and we're like, what the fuck happened to you, dude? What's going on? Oh, shit. Huh. You got a stain in your pants. He probably, probably was coming to death, wasn't he? You just keep finding a way to bring it back. <laughs> hey, man, that's a callback. Classic comedy. I don't, I don't care. I don't care who you are. That's funny. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where you're at yet. Uh, what we got to talk about next? That was actually uh, pretty much it for Development Hill. So okay. unless we have more to say, the ma- the maggot. The maggot rape was pretty much the bulk of it. That is the most talked about. Oh, 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 pun intended, huh? <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> we are uh, we are good to move on to awards and um, kind of dig into the movie itself some more now. All right. All right, let's do it. So, first up, the Zack Snyder, the man who is still not getting the Snyderverse restored, folks. Haha. The worst scene. I always find a way to... Det- if I can bring up something about Zack Snyder, <laughs> well, it's pretty easy because it's built into the show, so you're always I know have a chance and to jab at him. There was always it seemed like for a while, every a week a week would go by where there was one thing involving him doing something with Netflix or the fucking you know DC universe, whatever they want to do with it. So it was like, oh, this is perfect. So this one was perfect because the whole I read a bunch of DC news a couple of days ago about what they want to do but still have no plan. But yeah, what do you have? Getting back on track for the uh, worst scene. What did you come up with? Okay, so this is literally the opening of the movie where you have the characters that I have referred to as the Space Witch and Planet Master uh, exposition over a tabletop fucking video game. That's literally what they're on. And they're doing some stupid push-button game where they're exchanging this philosophical nonsense about the planet that they're going to and the mission and all this other shit. And then the commander who pops up on there talks to the master. And I'm just... That's that's part of where, like, for me, this movie is already, like, setting the bar for Goofy right up here, way at the top. And you're just like, all right, fine, the planet master, sure. He's fucking calling the shots with his red fucking gaseous face and obviously like witness protection program fucking disguised voice um (laughs) and it's it's just awful 
Um, and I say that with all the love in my heart because it is just the goofiest way to set up a movie about a crew going through space to go find out what happened to this other ship is to have some kind of weird philosophical discussion between some fucking low rent Mysterio dude and a fucking space witch fucking calling the shots and the space witch fucking telling him that like this is going to end badly blah 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 and it's it's just it's fucking terrible um the other thing i will mention that is of note is how it seemed like through the mid to late 70s and through the 80s that um you just have to love that they thought sophisticated technology was operated by massive switchboards and buttons and switches were going to be the way to do coordinated (laughs) movements. They're fucking crash landing shit where they're just like flipping switches and wait, flip them back. Okay, now flip them again. And it's just, it is the most ridiculous shit ever. Like they couldn't afford to put something on a stick to fucking turn to get there. But no, it's all switches, man. All switches here and there, here sci-fi films of old make me wish we instead of going to the touchscreen but future that we're clearly going into because everything's touchscreen that we were just switchboards with everything because it just looks more entertaining to just flip a bunch of knobs that looks like utter nonsense to anyone else like oh let me open like a future film was like we need to go get something from the instant food maker and they're just like flipping like 20 goddamn switches just to get a fucking piece of toast yeah and you're like i mean i don't that's not practical but i want to do it it's like some kind of Rube Goldberg setup just to fucking make all your shit. It, oh my god! Yeah, yeah it is. And that's not even in like for anyone that's like it's only in the low budget films. Oh no 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 no! It's a bunch of high budget sci fi films that were doing that shit too. Um, yeah, no, I I'm with you. This was a very. I remember watching it going, what does any of this that I'm watching right now have to do with what is coming up in the film I've heard about that yeah. I'm about to get? How do we get from Planet Master and Space Witch to Rapey Maggot? Where is that fuck? That, this does not look like a straight line to me, folks. I think you're trying to take me around my ass to get to my elbow. But you know what? I'm going to go along for the ride. I'm going to see. I, you are laying it down. I know what's coming. Pun intended. I just want to know how we're going to get there. Just want to know how we're going to get there. And if Freddy Krueger and Captain Spaulding are going to be with me on the ride, I feel like I'm in safe hands. Even though one of them loses their arm. Yeah, Captain Spaulding loses his arm. That So that scene where the crystal breaks off in his arm mm-hmm. and the shard goes up it, James Cameron thought of that. It's actually a really good scene. It's really, everyone's going, it like, is. oh, it shit. Is. Um, and it, and it act, so... You go with your Snyder Award, but that bit leads into my Ed Wood. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I just want to quickly say when I when I was watching that scene, I remember just going, not Captain Spaulding's arm, because for the other podcast, for those who haven't listened to it yet, I we did House House of Corpse, so I literally watched that first and then watched this. So I got my double doses of good old Sid Haig. And um, yeah, so I had that thought in my head. I was like, not Captain Spaulding's arm, no! <laughs> I was like, wait, no, different movie. Um, but mine, it actually has to do with a little bit of that crash land. It's actually, like, I, I kind of cheat a little bit. And, again, anything I pick, too, I'm kind of with you. Like, I still really like this film. It's just, like, these goofier aspects that are any Roger Corman film. I, I, at least the few I've seen. I'm not as reversed, but I've seen some. Um, but, yeah, the entire singers from when they take off and they travel and then they land. I swear to God, I remember watching going, this seems a bit quicker than it should be. It's supposed to be a distant planet, but they take off. It's bumpy. They're like, oh, God, no. And then they they settle. And then they're getting ready to relax. You get the weird scene where, like, she uses her body to shield Robert England. I'm like, I'll allow it. I mean, okay. wouldn't you if you were Robert England? I'd yeah. pop in her lap. Yeah, I was like, I'll allow this. Weird, but I'll allow it. Um, and then right when things slow down, it's like, oh, shit, we hit, I guess, space turbulence. Because then they're immediately sitting back down, hunkering back again. And then they settle again. And then all of a sudden it's, oh, shit, we're crash landing. It's pulling us in. I'm like, oh, my God, movie. Like, just give me a second. No, no, you got to get there. 
they're promising maggot rape. Like, <laughs> you've got to fucking get there. <laughs> oh, yeah, on his mind, I was like, we got to get to this maggot rape. Let's go. Because I... I'm, it leads to a different. I'm not going on a mission now, but I'm like, what is going on in this movie? And then you know we get to the planet, and the movie still doesn't explain anything because we're like, hey, maggot, okay? God damn, it, we gotta get to this maggot. I'm just like, oh. but luckily, by the time we got to the maggot, I was pretty much on board with the film. Not that the maggot solidified it or there's that hole again. Oh, um, god damn it! Um, I was on board, but yeah, it's just like. This scene just goes, and I'm like, wow. And it's just, it was just kind of goofy to keep sending them relax. And then you immediately have to hunker back down because they hit, hit some more turbulence, and then they crash land. And I love Sid Haig. I do love Sid Haig throughout the whole thing. Then when he just, like, he gets up, he just sits back down, he just gets back up, sits down, and then just finally gets up. Doesn't, like I said, mute, doesn't say a word, just a badass. And I'm like, you know what? You go, Sid Haig. You go. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I love, I love his character. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we touched on it, but when he signed on to do this, he told Roger Corman he only had one request, and Roger Corman's first response was, "You're not getting any more money." And <laughs> Sid Haig was like, "I don't want any more money." So, what's your request? I want to do the part mute. And Roger Corman was like, "What? Why?" He's like, "Well, I don't like the dialogue." I don't think it fits this character the way I see him. All right, we'll do the part mute. And for a large portion of the movie, he is absolutely mute. He gives a little, he gives this little sign thing where he's like giving somebody the knife hand, which if you're not in the military, you don't know what the knife hand is. Um, he knife hands him, closes his fist on him, and I don't know what the hell it's supposed to mean, but it means something. <clears throat> Everybody else in the movie knows what it means. Nobody else does. Yeah. And the only thing he says foreshadows his own death as they get into the pyramid. He he says, I live and I die by the crystals. And he he does die by the crystals. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the shard scene that, that we're talking about, um, one of his... <clears throat> So he throws these crystals to try and keep the door open so everybody can get inside. Mm -hmm. And he ends up finding out, or his uh, his little shurikens or whatever get destroyed, and he's totally upset about it. It, like, shatters his worldview. He's handed a gun, and he's, like, offended that he's even handed a gun. He was going to shoot uh, the the leader guy, Cabron, with it, and he's just, like, he throws it away. He's like, I don't want, I don't want a fucking gun. It's beneath me. I have my crystals. But I've lost my crystals. What am I supposed to do? I don't have my crystals. There's, there's a lot of character work happening oh, in, this, dude. in this moment. He's, he's in the background of the scene. He's just, he's on his fucking... He's like crouched down with his hands on his head. He's just like so distraught. And he gets back outside because he just can't take it anymore. He gets outside and he sees his fucking crystal shurikens are back. He's like, holy shit. And... Then one of them gets stuck in his arm, breaks off, and the shard starts crawling up his arm, and he's freaking out about it. And what does he do? He cuts his own damn arm off, like a badass, but the other one is still there, and it shoots into his chest and kills him. And that is the arm that is later the buffet for the aforementioned rapey maggot. So, say what you want. This shit ties together. There is not a wasted limb in this movie, literally. So, take note, young filmmakers. You're going to have a dangling arm in a scene. It better have a purpose behind it. And you can't just chop it off and throw it away. It I, better give birth to a giant rapey maggot. I was taking it. That is a metaphor, okay? It is not literally to put a giant rapey maggot in your movie because nobody is probably going to want to watch that. I might. I'm just saying. I will watch. There's probably lots of things you'll do during a rapey maggot scene to yourself, but I'm not going to go there. Anyway. Wh I, wow. How about how about your Ed Wood for the movie? This Segway. Is, this is my show. This is my show. <laughs> God damn it. All right, well, yeah, my Ed Wood, the worst line. 
Um, I gave, I believe it was to their uh, commander, the old guy, that oddly hinted he may have been fucking one of the younger female ladies. It's like this weird thing that's kind of not talked about, but talked about. Nuance. Um, but they're climbing up this uh, this like little cliff. It's like the pyramid to get into it. And um, at one point, he stops, turns to look, and he just goes, I'm getting old. And I'm tired. I'm tired and I want to go home. I was watching going, you're kind of stuck here, buddy, because you signed up for this mission. (laughs) And aren't you, like, in charge? Supposed to be. (laughs) It is. It's just so, it's like, it's just so ridiculous. And I mean, it, it, it really does help with, like, this ridiculous nature of this film. But it's just so out there because I'm having this moment of, like, we got to go up there and see what's going on. And then he just stops to deliver that line. And the best part is, like, the, the payoff of that is her going, uh, she, like, the lady, again, inspired that they fuck um, in this scene. She says something, he goes, oh, I feel young when you're around. I'm like, oh, boy. Yeah, I remember that line. It's very, it's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. It's yeah, it's very uncomfortable. Granted, and the ultimate payoff is that uh, he gets like one of the the more nastier sounding deaths. Not, not it's not maggot, but it the sound effects again. Like he gets attacked by what well, looks like a face hugger. If we're being completely honest, but tentacles come out and latch onto him and start sucking. And dear lord, was I not ready for the sound effects of the sucking happening in that in that scene? I was like, oh boy, they uh they they put money into that. And you know what? I'm I'm kinda proud of them. No, like that's like a stock sound because there are cartoons that use it, and it's usually <laughs> to like denote some like gooey or gross yeah. like spreading or like uh, I don't know. It it, it it makes me queasy when I think about it. But also watching it in this context, I couldn't help but laugh. Um, and it's also, ironically enough, it's it's my Michael Bay because I just I don't know whose idea it was to use that and think it's going to be scary because all I hear is I'm just like, no, that is not what that shit would sound like. I don't know what it would, what it would sound like, but I don't think it would sound like that. That's my producer I, note right there. I, I'm not scared by that sucking sound. It's not scary at all. I'm thinking of Looney Tunes. And I don't want to think about Looney Tunes when I'm watching a guy get his face sucked off by some weird imaginary fucking worm coming out of a pyramid. Fix that sucking sound. I mean, that's a better note than what Adam Ringo and Aquaman, as I like to always bring up thanks to the movie Crypt. Yeah. Could you, uh, could you take out the water? In an Aquaman movie, folks. In an Aquaman movie. <laughs> well, then I'll go ahead. We'll flip it today, and I'll do my worst filmmaking decision before we do the worst performance. Uh, mine kind of ties into what I was alluding to earlier with the just the the trash, the really quick takeoff, travel, landing, and um, me. It you know, obviously, it t- kind of taking me for you to go like, oh, okay, this is what's going on with the plot, and that's because the film, admittedly, and I, I get it. This is a Roger Corman thing. And I do, I'm not saying this, I'm not trying to knock it against them. It doesn't really bother with that much character development in those scenes. So it does take a bit for you to go like, uh, oh, okay, I get it. Okay, so this is her fear. Like, it it takes a while, which to an extent does work in the film's favor because you're as confused as they are. But at the same time, it's like, I, I would like to just be a little bit more in the know. Why are we, when we get to these scenes? A little dramatic irony would go a long way. Yes. So that that was my again. It's I honestly, any other film, this would actually probably be a pretty big first one. But this was just like a nitpick that I was like, because I actually I was sitting the whole time going, what am I going to put? Because I, I, I mean, I really like a good chunk of what I'm seeing in this movie. I was like, I'm not oddly enough not putting the maggot scene down for any awards because <laughs> I, well, not for like worst scene or you know worst filmmaking decision. Oddly enough, because I mean that. The scene speaks for itself. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was mine. So now we will do our next one since we flipped today. We're having fun today. Uh, the Steven Seagal. The worst performance. And I don't mean this as a slight 
against the performance or the acting skills of the wonderful oh my god where's her name i can't remember her name right now uh who played captain trainer um she oh boy anytime she was about to launch into a uh or whenever she felt like she was uh, recalling something traumatic, there are a couple of moments where she did that, and <laughs> she just had this look on her face, this fucking look on her face that was just like, I've seen some things, and, and I've got some feelings about them, and I think I wanna, I think I wanna talk about them, and I'm gonna go into a, I'm gonna go into a uh, flashback, but the movie's like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> Maggots, we don't have time. Uh, Grace Zabriskie. Yes, by the yes. way. Grace Zabriskie. She was great. Like, her her captain, like, the, the whole scene where she's, like, losing her shit and she's fucking on the guns, like, shooting at something that's not there. Like, that is awesome. She is totally just off her rocker, just completely fucking consumed by her own fucking fear. But those moments where she's, like, remembering something and she just, like, gets this wide-eyed stare in her face like she's just looking off into the distance and recalling something and she's like about to like turn her head and start telling the story the movie's like yeah no we're moving on <laughs> every fucking time every watch it again every fucking time she does that you'll, you'll catch it and you're just like oh shit this movie isn't gonna fucking try and ride on one of her flashbacks good call good call i love the idea of like it's roger corman just saying on maggot just drawing a picture of it. <laughs> drawing a picture of it with a boner. And he's just like, get there. Get there. Time is money. I got financial backers. I promised them something. They're getting it. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. For me, and this is, look, all the power to what she went through to not get crushed by a half-ton maggot. I did put Taffy... Um, Taffy O'Connell, um, because I, it's kind of like, uh, kind of the same thing. Like she spends a lot of the movie quite hysterical and just like all over the place. And I'm just kind of going like, I'm not really latching on to this, to this person. And look, and look, dare I say, I had no idea she was afraid of sex until I, even during the maggot scene. And so I read it from Corman and I was like, was she always afraid of sex? Corman, or do we have to justify this? This maggot scene to the financial backers. Well, I think I think for me it, it it makes sense when you when you set her up as being somebody who is even though she is very attractive, she is I'll take only, that from her. she is only uh, revered for her technical uh, abilities and her knowledge because she wears a lot of hats. She works with Robert England doing fucking autopsies apparently along with a lot of the other uh, technical stuff on the ship and so I mean maybe maybe she is maybe she's just that one hot chick that never got laid where is where is that woman in your life um ouch <laughs> um, it's a joke I'm joking I really it's my best friend this is what we do to each other don't come at me. It's um, fine. I'll just shit on his pillows later. Wow. 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 You have been using that on me since you've been back. And yet you choose to say that on the podcast that's going to get recorded and put out. The whole I, I have see what done. You're doing. I see what you're doing. You're... So, welcome to the podcast, Captain Double Down. It's nice of you to show up. You know I double down. Yeah, that's your... Everyone knows that. That's your secret fucking human, <laughs> superhuman power. It's your secret identity. What's scary is I, I do it to fuck with people, and it has consistently worked. Well, yeah. I mean, when you go from fucking one to I shit on your pillows tonight, yeah, you're going to draw some You're gonna draw some looks. Not the looks I want, but nope. looks. Nope. You're going to get looks. Just not the ones you want. No, but I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to segue this back to Taffy. It's not working. It's Taffy O'Connell. <laughs> yeah. She, Some, sometimes you just got to do a hard cut. You got 
I was like, how do I not hard cut, hard cut. Um, yeah, no, it's, I noticed I'm like, wasn't she also like essentially the seatbelt for Robert England on takeoff? She was. So she's like, she's a seatbelt. She's a, a medical doctor. She's helping fix stuff. She is completely losing her shit when they go out there to solve the uh, problem on the planet. <laughs> I'm like, she's doing a lot. I, good for her. Yeah, totally. But she will, you know, always be remembered for a maggot. <laughs> I mean, look, you could be remembered for worse things. And this is this is true. And you know what? It's a, it's a part of the film that has lived on in history. Yeah. Almost like one would say it's a silver lining. That's, hey, that's, how you, that's how you segue. That's, that's a good segue. Don't let it get to your head, though. Um, that's... <laughs> So that's let's do it then. Let's let's do the server lining. What is yours? Two names: Sid Haig, Robert England. They are my silver lining in this movie. Um, I think it's kind of like it's kind of like seeing somebody. I'm only going to count that as one, so that's three. Um, they are. Uh, there's one of those signs that when you when when you see some an actor that you're familiar with, it's it's a little like a, a little bit of comfort when you go into a movie that you may not have seen before. You know that they're there, so it makes it a little bit easier for you to be like, you know what, I am gonna check this out. Mm. It's got Robert England. It's got Sid Haig. How could I say no to that? And not gonna lie, I could I could see Sid Haig in this movie, and I could see why. You know, Tarantino would fall in love with him throughout his, you know, the, the movies that he's watched of his and ended up putting him in Jackie Brown. I can see how Rob Zombie saw him and used both sides, used the way that Sid Haig can just be menacing as a physical presence. And then come to find out the guy has an electric personality that he can turn and use in so many different ways you know you can be repulsed by him you can find him endearing you can find him fucking funny and he can do all of those things not pretty fucking funny to you sorry which i got how, how sad girl so you want to hear me like just gush about sid Haig and captain spalding quick aside uh in my pre uh navy days uh one halloween i dressed up as captain spalding uh, I had a huge beard at the time and I had a t-shirt that said, you can't have manslaughter without laughter. And I wore that and I painted my face up and I went to a, a Halloween party and apparently one of the people that was there was deathly terrified of clowns. And this guy had known me cause he was friends with some, uh, with, uh, one of his friends I worked with at a pizza shop that I was at. And I don't think he recognized me in the makeup. So he saw me from across the party and I looked at him and I did that whole spiel and he avoided me the entire night. Found out that he was so scared. He like almost pissed himself when I did that shit. Holy shit. Yeah. He, was, he was like the child in that scene. He was so fucking scared and I died. That, that shit was so funny to me. So yeah. That is, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, just a little preview of what I've said about Sid Haig. What I like about him a lot, and, uh, and obviously he plays a mute type in this film, and because it is like you said, right? Like like I kind of said earlier, you know, when I saw House House and Corpses, you know, I, I mentioned it in the episode, you know, that was kind of like for a lot of people who kind of know his career, that was a huge revival for him. You know, that sparked a huge, especially for a lot of young horror fans like me that were going over that time. We saw that and went, "Oh, dude, who is this Captain Spaulding guy? Who is?" And then, you know, someone like me who was getting the film and really looking up all these people was like, oh, who is this guy? This guy's fucking awesome. And, you know, watching those reach going, oh, my fucking God, I love, I love this character. That, yeah, when I when I put this on, I was like, hey, you know, it's like my, it's, you know, we do it. Any, I do it all the time when it's like, especially something from my charter, you know. And so I'm going, hey, it's Sid Haig. I went, hey, it's Captain Spaulding. because I'm so tied to how much I love that character but yeah i mean the guy in especially in house and devil's rejects um he knew the way there's so many scenes where he'll sit there and crack a joke and someone says something that pisses him off mm -hmm. and that fucking smile to just gr 
fucking stare and the little growl he would do if you like if you turn your you know i mean we all live in remote sound balls and stuff shit so if you just turn up enough that little growl that kind of emits from him and like it's like all of a sudden it's it's on like say something else i'm gonna fuck you up and it's like oh dude like yeah yeah i oh, fucking love said hey yeah yeah he can just turn on the dime it's amazing and uh i wish we would have had him a little bit longer but the fact that we had like what 40 years maybe longer worth mm-hmm. of movies that he's been in over decades including i mean he was a mainstay in black exploitation and exploitation movies mm-hmm. so if you are any kind of any kind of student of those subgenre of film i highly encourage you to go check them out um I, I I can't recommend his movies enough. Yeah, he yeah he's the man. Obviously, we all know about Robert England. He's always just great to see in anything um, he does. And thank you know, thankfully we still have him. Um, for mine, for my silver lining, um, we we've been kind of talking about it a lot. When if it comes, you say James Cameron, I'm gonna kill you. It's shit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I should have started saying it. James Cameron, run. James Cameron, run. <laughs> Do you see the progress? Do you see it? Yes, we see it, James Cameron. <laughs> oh, sorry. So that South Park episode was great. Um, no, actually, we mentioned earlier with Corman and his use of budget, and I gotta say, I didn't know what you told me about the set because I actually, by sort of lining, is the set design for this film, and I because I do Corman look try to try to look down on this man as much as you want for you more film snobbish types. But God damn, this, this man know how to achieve so much with so little, as we've been talking about. It doesn't matter if he's not directing the film himself or just producing it. He knows how to use a fucking budget to his advantage. And the set design of this film is proof of that. Like, what he does from what is probably just the same two, three sets maybe, but he makes it seem so vast, so big. It, it functions as so many different parts of the film completely impressive and it's not the first time other films i've seen he does the same thing the man knows how to make such a probably more than any big budget movie i've seen knows how to fucking use a set and how to make it seem more than what is being shown to you yeah because like i said it's all an illusion and if you can make your movie look more expensive than it really is people are going to pay attention to it people are going to take it more seriously people are going to give it more credit than they probably would if they knew what went into making that movie or how much it costs to make that movie because apparently how much a movie's budget is is inexplicably tied to its worth and your investment in it which is a sad way to go about watching movies um some of my favorite movies are for all intents and purposes shitty low budget movies and I will happily watch those kind of movies over and over and over again because I do get so much enjoyment out of them. And on top of that, I can't think of a better compliment for these kinds of movies than for somebody who is eager to make their own movies, who is fascinated by how to make movies. These are the kinds of things you should watch. Look at what they do with a set design. Look how they block their shots. Look how they use every resource they have available to them and make and make their movie. Because if you only operate under the model that if you don't have the money, don't make the movie, you're denying yourself so much. And that shouldn't be the case because, yes, resources help out a lot. Money helps out a lot. Not going to take that away, but creativity, desire, commitment, and just pure talent can get you a long way. I mean, think about it nowadays that we have the ability to use a drone and have aerial camera work that used to cost thousands upon thousands of dollars to get done. And you could have those kinds of shots faked. Like, there are shots of um, in Dawn of the Dead that Romero didn't have the use of a helicopter for. What'd he do? He fucking rigged up on a crane, and he fucking 
moved the crane around to get the shots that he needed, created the illusion that you were looking at this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's all about knowing the craft and knowing how to construct this world that you want to present on screen. And for my money and my enjoyment, these kinds of films have that in spades. Always will. Yeah. No, I, that was perfectly said. I really don't say I can elaborate on that. Um, Cause yeah, it, you know, any, and not just like, so not just this, you watch trauma films, you watch a full moon film. You can see like how these guys are just using every tool in their box to give you a movie. And even the ones that quote unquote, look low budget they're still doing everything in their power to give you something special and something that's fun and entertaining and you're going to have a good time with you know what i mean they're still using the tools of trade it's just the money makes it look again quote unquote cheap for those who really care about that um i know both of us don't well i mean it's it's a weird set of criteria to 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 use and limit yourself on what you're actually going to spend your time on. And if that's how you choose to do it, by all means, go for it. Mm -hmm. I'm, you're not hurting me at the end of the day. I think that you are just limiting yourself to what is out there because there are, there are going to be things. Cause sometimes a lot of these movies for the most part, they can be largely forgettable, but there are moments in those things where you're just like, Holy shit, I can't believe they did that. And you have to you have to put take your hat off to that because if you do enjoy film, it's not it may not necessarily be about that whole thing overall. It's about these moments where you're just like, wow, that is amazing. I can't believe they did that. How the fuck did they do that? That's even more amazing to me. Is like mm -hmm. how you know trying to figure that out, trying to figure out how exactly did they do that? They had no damn money. How the fuck did they do this? Yeah, or Are something like um, you know like. Okay, so I'll give you uh, I'll give you a little example. There's a uh, that movie Deadbeat by Dawn. Oh um, yeah, yeah. That th the the guy that made that he was putting himself on the line and literally stealing shots and going and putting himself in harm's way literally to make his movie. And I have to respect that. I have to. And you can you can find fascinating stories like that mm -hmm. by going into these weird places in in cinema history and finding movies like that well i know what i like to bring up and connor i'm sorry because i know you're not a fan of this movie uh so forgive me please um but spookies <laughs> a movie that you know i get if people are like not on board with it but like just knowing the fact that it was filmed to be one film they literally what we've been talking about they ran out of money couldn't finish it, and then they were like, someone was like, hey, look, can we just tr figure out a way to finish this movie and just tie it together? And found essentially a completely different movie, and then just put it together and was like, here you go, here's your movie. Like, yeah, that things like that, I'm like, you know, like, no, at no point am I sitting there going, you know, sitting there going, this is one of the greatest ones I've ever made, but I am, goddamn, if I'm not having a good time watching a film with farting fucking zombies. <laughs> you never thought you needed it. Until you realize you do. <laughs> but with that, unless you, we have more to add to the awards section, it's it's time for our final section. Oh. <laughs> the that, one. That section. That section. The one I look forward to because I do the least amount of work on it. <laughs> it's all up to the co hosts. Oh, shit. Are you telling me you've done nothing? <laughs> no, I did something. Okay, good. So I'll be like, I swear to God, we are recording right now. On that, <laughs> moving on to a fun-filled segment known as What's in the Box. What's in the fucking box? Thank you, Brad Pitt. Didn't know we could get Brad Pitt, did you? Yeah, we got him. Um, <laughs> so, Classiest reference. Trying, the show. <laughs> trying to find funny, like one or two sentence reviews of this movie was not easy and I um, I, I really didn't find any um, there is a there's a couple of lines from this review by this guy named James Atkinson where he he says uh, 
The crew of a very noisy spaceship discover a pyramid that forces them to act out scenes from the movie Alien. It doesn't, but okay. Galaxy of Terror is not like the poster or title suggests. A more apt title would be Planet of Weird Roger Corman Moments and Budgetary Constraints. It's a little long, but I guess. Also, he's always had budgetary constraints. It's called low budget. Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, anyway, this movie contains a ton... Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to read this verbatim as it's as it's written. Anyway, this movie contains a of a ton of ludicrous space dialogue, Ghostbuster suits with headlight upgrades, graphic death scenes, alien butthole structures, and space maggot molestation, which makes it worth the price of admission. But apparently this guy was too cheap, so he streamed it on Amazon Prime for free. Don't go out on a date with this guy, ladies. He's going to make you pay. I like how he he down he he downs it and he's like alien buttholes and maggots, worth the price of admission. And I'm like you can't draw a line there. <laughs> you just though I will say he gave this two and a half stars. So again, take what you will from that. I that's high praise. <laughs> yeah. And this is from Cameron, not James. <sighs> Come on, Jimmy. Roger Corman did a ton of blow and watched Alien, predicted Event Horizon. Made a movie that stylistically resembles Alien in some ways. James Cameron worked on this movie. He found a cheap way to make maggots move or some shit. And rewrote a scene he directed where a woman is sexually assaulted by a maggot? Yes, this is a Roger Corman movie, all right. I it's like did he get did he give it a good review? Uh, uh he actually score? gave it three and a half stars. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so some deaths are more meh than others, but there's plenty of Corman goop on show here. It's actually well made to a tight budget. Efficient, one would call it, actually, but that's what Corman does. Produces a film on a relatively small budget, gets certain things right, like a good soundtrack, good clothing design, competently shot, edited, even though there was three editors, so make of that information what you will, good set design, some good actors, practical effects, and gore, and matte paintings. He put an uh, exclamation point after that. So He gets it. Yeah, he gets it. Um, <laughs> so, like I said, some of these are just very, very... But I will say this. I do like this. Whoever uh, Belial Cabroni is. Uh, did you say Cabroni? Yes, I did. Their words, not mine. Uh, sleazy, slimy, low-budget sci-fi insanity. That should have been on the fucking cover box. That is the tagline for this movie. Because yes. what does it actually say on the box? Hell has just ah, hell has just been relocated. Yes. Again, doesn't technically really fit with the film, but yes. Nope. Uh. Yeah. I mean, it's eighty minutes. What do you What do you expect? I'll I'll, I'll read this little paragraph here. There's some unnecessary plotting. P-L-O-D-D-I-N-G since it's only 80 minutes but it makes the gore in action all the more jarring when it does occur. I think he's trying to say this movie's boring. Oh, and a giant rapey worm lurks around every corner. Watch out! There's only one. I like the idea that he saw a cut of this film where any corner you go around you need to be deathly afraid of a giant rapey maggot. Still, it's the most notable thing about this. This person, Ben Hibbard, gives Galaxy of Terror a half a star. Oh, wow. Yep. Galaxy of Terror is produced by Roger Corman and directed by Bruce D. Clark. And it's one of the most egregious ripoffs of Alien put to film. The f this film rips off the plot of Alien beat for beat at least up until the 40th minute or so as I stopped watching by then. The plot was nonsensical, the set design and cinematography were garbage, the audio was hollow, and the characters were as flat as a pancake. I wasn't planning on writing anything for this film, but it was so utterly terrible, I thought I'd warn people against this film. So... He, he stopped watching 40 minutes in, but yeah, a review? Yeah. Stopped watching, wasn't going to say anything, but then decided, I have to. I have to warn people against this atrocity of cinema, this ripoff of Alien, beat for beat. Somewhat. 
Kind of. Maybe a little bit. He hasn't seen contamination. <laughs> no, this guy probably doesn't know what he's talking about. There were like 26 comments on his post too, and I didn't take the time to read them because I have better things to do with my life. Um, I don't. So yeah, I don't know what the uh, consensus was going to be on this guy's opinion. Hopefully, since a lot of these scores were three, two and a half to three stars and mm -hmm. up, that they were going to tell this guy he was smoking rocks and he didn't know what he was talking about. But one can only hope. You would think that. But yes. I have read comment sections before in the past, and boy, howdy. I mean, Is look, they something... can get spicy. It's the internet. Yeah, people... People get really brave and very forthcoming with their opinion, which is ironic, because if you try to ask somebody their opinion in real life, they won't give it to you. They'll just lie. Um, I'm very honest about how I feel about movies. <laughs> yeah, and we all know how much you love a giant rapey worm. You... It's not... Nope. Did I did not say that. I got no, no, my show, my show. <laughs> it's whatever you want it to be, dude. He's single, ladies. I don't like this recurring joke. In case anyone was wondering, on the overall letterbox score, I forget well this ranks because in it, but it's sitting at a two point six letterbox score, which is I think I want to say a tad bit better based off of algorithm they got on Rotten Tomatoes than on Rotten Tomatoes algorithm. But also, it's, you know, user reviews on Litterbox, which I trust I, that, about that much more, about a tad bit more than I do critics. Um, but then you get people like that that are like, I watched 40 minutes and then had to say something. <sighs> I don't trust your opinion if you only watch half the movie. At least watch the whole movie. Look, I may have felt a certain way. We both may have felt a certain way about Halloween Ends. We watched the whole goddamn movie. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Mostly because, you know, we paid for the ticket. So I was like, I'm not leaving this theater till those credits roll. <laughs> ah, but in, in for a penny, in for a pound. Yep. And I know I'm not watching it again on Peacock. That's not happening. Um, That's what's in the box this week. <laughs> so with that, let's, uh, let's wrap things up. And close the book on Galaxy of Terror. Before we, I have what's on next week's episode. The usual social media stuff. Uh... You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Filmgasm Productions. It should be more active now that someone's back to, you know, actually pull some weight around here. If you want to shoot us a recommendation. It's not my fault you're Twitter illiterate. I just have it. I barely tweet on it. Go get him. Internet nerds. Swarm. They won't. Look, I'm trying, okay? I would have to really... I, look, with the amount of shit I've said about the Snyderverse and have yet to face any repercussions, I'll be fine. Uh, you say that now. Yeah, watch me wake up to like a, a deluge of tweets. Uh, if you want to shoot us a recommendation, feel free to email us on... Uh, at, sorry, at filmgasm at gmail.com. The, the season's open for next year, folks. The, the schedule's pretty packed for the rest of the year, but... If you have any recommendations for next year, let us know. Um, if you'd like to, to donate... Did, I'm sorry, did you have something to say over there? I was going to say, so you're saying there's a chance. God damn it. I ever... <laughs> so I went to the Regal so many times to go see Trick or Treat and then Halloween. Hopefully Terrifier 2 this weekend. Um, they keep playing that damn commercial where they just quote movies. And I fucking hate that commercial. <laughs> so much. And that's one of the ones they quote. <sighs> Now that I've got that out of the way. I like it a lot. If you'd like to donate, support us in that way, you can find us on Anchor. Finally, feel free to get on our site, filmgasm.com, for reviews, shows, articles, and all of our episodes. Where, honestly, if I'm being honest, the reviews have been held down by Josh and Connor because I have been slacking and I, I don't see an end to my slack. Talk about not pulling your weight. I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. I've been gone for months. Uh, next week, we'll be going old school once again on this show. Quite old school. Um, and looking at a classic example of a not talked about cinematic crossover. Because I don't care what you people say. MCU was not the first cinematic shared universe. It was not. It's a little thing called Universal Movie Monsters. Um, but we are looking specifically at Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. 
I'm looking forward to this. I've seen I've seen the classics. I've seen you know Frankenstein, Wolfman, all of them. I've not seen a lot of the sequels, a lot of the crossovers. So first time hearing from me, I'm very excited to see what has made this be considered a bad film. And if I actually end up liking it, which will probably be what happens. Um, on Filmgasm, it will be Colton and Connor. They're looking at uh, one of Tim Burton's best and, um, honestly, personal, my personal favorite Tim Burton film, uh, Sleepy Hollow. So look out for that one. And on Oscar Sunday, uh, they'll be taking a closer... Uh, ah, da, 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 I cannot talk, apparently. They'll be looking... I said taking a closer look. They will be looking at the closer to the initial trilogy, if you ignore the two films they felt the need to add to it, uh, The Bourne Ultimatum. So that should be a fun one. Like I said, initial trilogy, for those who want to ignore the one with Jeremy Renner and when Matt Damon tried coming back. Until then, when deciding to answer a distress call on a distant planet, make sure to keep your fears in check. We don't want those used against you. See you next week on Beyond the Bad. Thank you.